course, here we are, you know, years, 75 years later, and they're still here, and they look like they're going to be here many, many years beyond uh, both you and me. The Delaware Fort Miles was constructed as a U.S. artillery fort. Um, there were two 16-inch guns, two 12-inch guns, uh, eight eight-inch railway guns, and four six-inch guns. All of them had a range of over 15 miles. And to spot the fall of that shot, to be able to call in the other shots, you need forward artillery observers. And so the U.S. Army constructed a series of what are called fire control towers, FCTs, up and down the Delaware Beach, 11 of them, and then four of them in New Jersey. They're, they're probably our best advertising that we've got for our fort, which by the way is underground, people can't see it. So the towers are the eyes of the fort. They're the only men, because uh, they were all men, the only men who could actually see the enemy who are approaching our homeland. And they were the eyes that then called in the artillery fire from the guns located right inside this facility, uh, inside Battery 519. My grandfather has, was born and raised in Delaware. Um, he, his family, um, the Cooch family, actually uh, came to Delaware in 1746, and he's lived in Newark, Delaware, his whole life. He joined the military um, when he graduated the University of Delaware in June of 1941 and received his first orders um, that July 30th of 1941. As head of the mine detail, his job was to prep the mines, um, load them with TNT, attach um, cable to them. Um, they actually helped put them on the mine planters, the ships, and then he oversaw the um, planting of the mines um, into the water. So he um, would be on the bridge um, overlooking all of this as it happened. Um, he was also in charge of making sure that all of Lewis and Rehoboth um, maintained their blackout shades. Residents, um, residences and businesses at night would have to really um, shade their homes from light so that um, German ships couldn't see the shoreline and see the lights on the shoreline. He would tell stories of visiting my um, grandmother at the time they were dating. Um, so he would go to Rehoboth and meet with her and actually always make sure that her blackout shades were down because they were close to the water and as part of his duty. Um, so those are kind of the things I think that stand out the most. He also used to tell me that he would position his soldiers on the beach so that they were facing him and he could face out and give orders while watching the sunrise. So that was kind of his little joke that his time of enjoying Fort Miles that way. And then I guess the last thing he always mentioned was the tent city, that when he arrived here, it was the very you know beginning of the war and um, it, there were no barracks yet, it was just tents. And that first winter was brutally cold and they just had to make do with, with what they had at that time. Uh, the beach itself was very, there was nothing here. There was nothing down there but the tower. Uh, today you drive up and down our beach and you see trees and all that. Uh, there were none of that. It was just all sand. Um, no lights, no ambient light. Um, sometimes, usually an eight-hour shift, sometimes it could be a 12-hour shift. Uh, no lavatories. You got sand all around. Uh, coal stove. No running water. Um, and in 1942, remember, the Germans actually came ashore with saboteurs. We, German U-boats lurked off the coast. So the guys were only armed with their small arms. And the word quickly got out after the summer of 42 when the Germans landed saboteurs in Long Island and Florida that keep on the lookout for Germans sneaking up on the tower at night. So I was home front, but we were being attacked. Our homeland was being attacked. So our guys were very, very apprehensive, and it was very, very lonely duty. Uh, when I created this place, 
this Fort Miles Museum um, and this particular room, my vision was we'd bring them all together and nest them all in this room where they belonged. Of course, the beautiful Schroeder, which is the only painting existent of an actual scene during the war of what went on in the tower, because Mr. Schroeder was a private here at Fort Miles, because uh, it was super secret what was going on in that tower. So uh, we, we tell the Howard Schroeder story here in this room. And, you know, art is important to the story of World War II. I mean, World War II was, you know, the, there were three fronts in World War II. And, and too often we don't hear about the third front. We hear about the European front. But the third front was the home front, it was here. And it was supporting the victory for the other two. And morale of the home front is as important as morale with the troops in the, in the Atlantic European campaign in the Pacific. So this is war propaganda. And where we use it, and propaganda in a good sense, where we use it is telling the story of World War II. This is what the guys did that serviced the mines out in, in Delaware Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. These are the guys at the fishing pier preparing the mines. Uh, this is what the guys did in the towers. Uh, and that's as important as the guys, you know, actually taking off and attacking the Japanese carriers or, you know, looking to shoot Adolf Hitler. I mean, you know, because it's the story that builds American morale. And uh, it's, it's a very important story, and this artwork does that. So here it is, like the towers, helping us teach the story of World War II. And too often kids today in school don't get World War II taught to them. This helps us do that uh, through the eyes of a guy who was actually here. So it's just not us talking, not just historians or interpreters talking. You look, look at the real deal, you know, and here he is. Here, here was the guy. Here's what he painted. This is what the guys did in those towers. So it's really kind of cool when you think about it, you know. So. And then we're working on Tower 3 at Dewey Beach. And, um, and how it's, you know, beautiful cobalt lights around it. And so the towers are still telling their story, you know, in 2019. So I'm excited that we still got them, and I'm excited for the preserving them, and I'm excited for them telling the story, which quite frankly is sending people up to our museum where you and I are sitting right now. So they're still working, working in a different way, but they're still working. So the tower story is an exciting story. And it's not Gary Ray saying it, but it's Betsy Reamer, who's the head of the Lewis Chamber of Commerce. The number one question she gets is, what are those big, tall cylinders out on the beach? Because people just don't know. So that's what we call an education, an opportunity to educate, right? So, so they're still, still doing their job a long time after they were supposed to fall in the water, and they're still here.